Hi, my name is Marcus Bannerman, and I'm going to talk you through this distillation lab um, from at the University of Aberdeen. Um, the reason why I'm doing a cheesy overdub is that the quality of the original recording is ruined by the noise of this machine. It has a load of fans operating it, and it sounds like this. What you see here is the distillation system. Now, in your course, you've actually covered... Yeah, that's no good. So what we'll do is talk you through the actual equipment itself, um, its key elements, so you can recognize them, and then look at actually operating it and how you'd sample product from it. So at the bottom of uh, this column, we have this black drum, which is the reboiler. It's essentially just a drum, about a third filled, if you look at that level gauge on the outside, with isopropanol water mixture. And it's got a giant kettle element in it that will heat this up and cause it to boil. And that boiling vapor will then rise up through the column that you see above. And this column is a steel tube wrapped in uh, lagging or insulation or rock wall insulation and inside the steel tube there are trays and what's really nice about this column it because it's an educational column is that we actually have a glass window at the bottom that looks lets you look inside and at one of these trays in operation along the side of the column you'll notice some valves and those are allowing you to feed in fresh feed so you could operate this column continuously always putting in new feed and um, we won't do that though in this experiment we're going to operate under total reflux so we're just going to boil what's inside there and keep it inside there apart from what we sample now looking at the top of the column what happens is the vapor rises up and enters this black drum you see at the top and that is a condenser it's another heat exchanger and its job is to condense the vapors and send it into the reflux drum. Now the reflux drum is this thing in the middle of the screen about now, which essentially is a glass container that allows the reflux to separate out into a pure liquid phase and then sends it back into the column or takes it off as top product, depending on what you're doing with it. And the rest of the piping is to control the pressure inside the column. So the piping that you see there, the flexible hosing, actually carries the cooling water in and out of the condenser. The cooling water then flows along the top, and you can see its temperature is being measured by that white cable that ends in a thermocouple. And then the pipe that goes out to the right-hand side, the far right side, that is the waste outlet pipe. But the pipe that's joining it in the middle is also some uh, waste uh, water, and it's coming from a piece of equipment called a water jet vacuum pump. So that's this kind of device that you see now in the middle of the screen that will zoom in. And what a water jet vacuum pump does is water sprays up from the bottom through the water jet, and that draws, sucks air in from the left-hand side using the Venturi effect. And you could see that this is connected to our column uh, via this red valve that's perpendicular to the flow, which means that it's, it's isolated, it's not connected right now. And that's because what we're going to do is operate our column at atmospheric pressure. We're not going to look at vacuum distillation at this time. What you can see just in the middle of the screen now is a large glass vessel that is for receiving the top product if we were operating in continuous operation, but we're not going to use that. And you should see a few other pieces of equipment in there as well. Probably the key ones are some piping to control the cooling water. And then down at the bottom here, we have two large tanks. Those are to collect and hold feed ready to be put into the column. And at the very bottom, you see this uh, solid metal heat exchanger. And its job is to cool the product coming from the bottom of the column before storing it in some containers on the right. Now, again, we're not going to use that. We're just going to boil up what's inside this column and send it around in a continuous loop. So our first task is to start a flow of cooling water to the condenser at the top to make sure that when this thing starts boiling, all vapors are sent back to the column and don't escape. So we're just gonna turn this control valve on here. Control valves let us set flow very carefully. And we're gonna read that flow by looking at this rotameter down here. A rotameter has a rotating plug inside of it, this black thing you can see. And what you do is you read the flow rate by looking levelly across the top of it and reading off against the marks on the side of the rotameter. Uh, so that looks like a good flow rate. We're going to now leave that for the rest of the experiment and not touch it. Then what we're going to do is look at the control system. And this control system has a lot of readouts. It's showing us temperatures along the column. Uh, that's all those readings you see there. Those actually measure the temperature of each tray. We also can read the temperature at the bottom inside the reboiler and read the temperature inside the condenser at the top there as well as the temperature of the condensing water. Now down here is where we set the boiler um, power and we set that as a percentage. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is just type 100%, turn the boiler up to full speed. And what you'll notice is that this then changes a readout on the column itself. 
So while the control system allows you to set the power as a fraction of zero to 100%, the actual column itself will read out the power of applied to the heater. Um, it's a bit of a, well, you know, it's lying to you because while it says 3,900 watts is being used, it actually is only applied once you press the green button there and the light comes on. So be careful, your instruments might lie to you and say four kilowatts is being applied, but not actually. And what you notice now is we're just checking that the valve here is aligned vertically with the flow. And that makes sure that this black valve is open and the column is vented. You can see it's at zero bar gauge. And the other one, uh, the red valve, we're making sure was perpendicular to make sure that the vacuum uh, pump is disengaged. Now you'll notice after a bit of time, the heat, uh, the temperature is rising in the reboiler. And also T4, you can see there's a slightly elevated temperature on the tray, but that doesn't indicate boiling yet. You'd expect the system to boil at about 80 degrees C. You can see the cooling water also at the top right has about the same temperature, and that's because we're not actually doing any condensing yet either. And you should also notice that all thermocouples are you know, disagreeing with each other by about a degree, and that's just the error in the thermocouple and the thermocouple measurement. So after about 20 minutes of heating, the column will have started to boil. And if you leave it too long, as we've done here, you'll notice that the reflux drum at the top is absolutely full of liquid. And this is what we call flooding. We have flooded the condenser. So luckily we caught this before the liquid started to spill over from the condenser out the vent pipe. But um, this is a great example of what happens when you have too high a flow rate of gas inside your column. So the problem is that we had our reboiler set to 100%, and that actually causes very vigorous boiling that will blow liquid up the column and prevent it from returning down the column. Um, now what we've done is we've actually just dialed down the, the, um, the column uh, power to about 20% or so, and you can see immediately the liquid can then drain down into the column. And if you take a look at the column itself, what you'll notice is that there is a strongly boiling mixture inside there. Now that is actually, those are trays that are suffering from weeping. So we're at the other end of it here. Essentially all that water, that liquid, sorry, is falling through the column rapidly and flooding these trays. Um, it's okay for now though, right? What, what, we're, what we're doing is waiting for the column to respond to our recent change in power. And you can see already the trays are starting to drain down into a more reasonable level. What you're looking for is that the tray is bubbling away, has a good quantity of liquid on it, and that it isn't bubbling up into the tray above. So this is a perfectly acceptable level here inside the tray. And um, what you'll notice here is there's a small bit of metal entering the, the system from the left. That's actually a thermocouple. And the key thing for you to note is the thermocouples are measuring the temperature of the liquid on the tray. That's very important for your calculations later, as you'll be able to calculate what the temperature of the boiling mixture is. And it's a boiling mixture, so the temperature relates to the concentration. You can see here this thing is vigorously boiling away. We're basically playing around with the, 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 the power of the reboiler, trying to find a good rate where we're not flooding the condenser, but also getting a good level of liquid on the tray. And we've set it to about 25%. One of the things you want to be keeping an eye on is the uh, is the reflux drum at the top and you can see that liquid is actually spilling over into a little pipe over the back. That's called a weir. The point of the weir is to ensure that we have some liquid to return to the column um, and also to take off as reflux. Once we're convinced that the column has reached steady state, we will actually look to take samples of this reflux so that we know what the concentration is in the top of the column. And what you want to do is take a very small amount. This is actually far too much taken here. Um, because this is, you're going to have to wait for the system to regenerate that reflux before you actually return it to the column again and it spills over the weir. So be careful about how much you sample there. We're also going to take a sample from the bottom of the column to understand what's actually inside the reboiler. So we know what's inside the condenser and what's inside the reboiler. The first task we do is open the two valves. and I'm also pulling back a valve lock at the same time. Then we take a small sample down here as well. Now you've got to be very careful. This sample is boiling hot um, and you don't have to worry too much about the quantities. I'm still sampling a bit too much here. Um, but with the reboiler, you have such a large volume to sample from, it doesn't really matter how much you take out of there. Once you have your samples collected, what you've got to do is actually put them into small vials so that they can be analyzed using gas chromo chromatography. So you'll use a small dropper to take a sample out from your, your beaker and place it into these vials. Now you don't need to fill these vials to the brim, we only need about a mil for the actual GC to operate. Um, the main thing you should do though is label the samples so that you can determine the time and where they were taken from.
top or the bottom of the column. It's very important that you label these carefully so that you can determine them and you seal them as well to make sure that they don't volatilize or vaporize before they are sampled. You should then return anything that you've sampled uh, that's left over back into the feed drum so they can be returned to the column after the experiment. So attached to the column, you'll notice there are two black pipes that are valved off and actually they're open at the moment. And what these two pipes do is they actually go to a pressure transducer that measures the pressure drop across the column. So this pressure transducer you see here, um, it, it really provides very valuable feedback about the state of the flow inside the column. For example, the pressure drop tells you how much liquid's in there from hydrostatics and also how fast your vapor flow is from the frictional pressure drop. So we'll have a look at an experiment on that. So what we're gonna do is change the uh, boiler and turn it off, I think. So we're gonna start off by setting it to zero. And then what we're gonna do is keep an eye on the DP measurement in millibar in the middle of the column. And what you'll notice is about now it's 20 millibar. And just by turning off the reboiler, what you might expect is that pressure will drop. And that's because less, less fluid is boiling and so you'd expect the frictional pressure to drop as the vapor velocity drops. But what's quite surprising is that you actually see a bounce. So here's the graph of pressure versus time over the duration of a full experiment. And what you'll see is that generally speaking, the pressure is, is steady, um, but you can see there's this rise at about 3000 seconds, and that's actually as we start to flood the condenser. And then the pressure drops a little as we actually uh, power down the reboiler. And then we get a large spike in the pressure here. And so the question is, where is this spike coming from? And that's something you should answer in your report. It seems very strange that turning off the reboiler would cause such a large spike. So at this point in the lab, you should be ready to shut down the system. The first thing I did was turn off the uh, heater. It's already at 0%, but I made sure it was off. Then I'm opening up this valve and the uh, feed drum where I've been placing my uh, remaining samples or unused samples. I then open the valve allowing me to feed liquid into the column and I turn on the feed pump and this will start to actually pump feed from that tank into the column and what I'm doing is I'm just returning all of the samples that I didn't use back into the column so that the next group to use the column can carry on their distillation. Um, and it's an interesting thing to note, as the distillation lab proceeds, we actually lose quite a lot of isopropyl alcohol and we have to top it up um, because what will happen is people will take samples of the reflux and the reflux will have a very high purity of isopropanol in it and this actually removes the isopropyl alcohol out of the column. Um, now I'm just closing all the valves after I finish pumping everything into the column and uh, then all I've got to do is check everything's off uh, switch off the system here, the computing system, and leave the uh, the condenser cooling water running because the system is still hot and I don't want vapor to escape. So I check that and give a cheesy thumbs up <laughs> and we're done. All right. So your job for your lab report is to try and understand what are the concentrations on each of these trays that you see. Um, so you've got samples for the bottom of the column, samples for the top of the column from the reflux, and you also have the temperatures on each tray. And you're gonna use those to calculate and or estimate the concentrations on each stage. And then you should use that to estimate what the real performance of this column is. Clearly when we have a problematic flow like this, it should not have an efficiency of one, efficiency of 100%. You also need to look at this pressure behavior here and try and explain from a hydraulic point of view, what is going on? Why is pressure such a good indicator here of the performance of the column and what that pressure spike could be caused by given that the reboiler has been turned off before that spike appeared or just before that spike appeared. Please be careful and take into account the reality of the, of the system that you're studying. For example, heat loss is gonna significantly change the, the design process for this column. You, you won't be able to use assumptions like constant molar overflow, not in the same way you might do it in a classroom problem. Good luck with your report and don't be afraid to reach out and get help from me either through the tutorial sessions, via email or Teams.